So today, uh, I'm going to talk about explorations in cooperative distributed systems with Uber's Ringpop. I'm an engineer uh, at Uber on the dispatching team. For the past year, I would say, uh, I've been working on this project. And I'm going to talk to you about how Ringpop has brought uh, cooperative applications to Uber and how it makes those applications a little bit more scalable and fault tolerant uh, than they would have been without it. And I'll, I figure I also mentioned that there are stars that I put in some of the illustrations that I made on the slide, so for you to uh, focus if you lose track of what I'm saying or uh, lose track of the point that I'm trying to make. So I'll look out for those stars. Okay, so first some high level details about RingPop. Uh, Originally written in JavaScript on Node.js, our dispatching systems are primarily written in Node.js. Um, although a lot of Uber's infrastructure and application stack is moving over to Go, uh, so RingPop is now written in Go. Uh, there's, it's, and it's actually open source and available on GitHub. So if you want to go and browse to uh, the Uber organization and the RingPop Node or RingPop Go repos, you can see all of the code uh, that we're working on. And when having to describe what RingPop is, uh, back maybe nine months ago or to a year ago, when I created the GitHub repo, I had put in the description field scalable and fault tolerant application layer sharding. Uh, so though that might be what you can do with Uber, uh, sorry, with RingPop, uh, I don't know if that's its, its essence. Uh, some people actually call RingPop just a hash ring at Uber. Um, these days, I'm trying to boil it down a little bit more, and I call it a library that brings cooperation and coordination to distributed applications. So to bring more clarity to that, before I dive into the details of RingPop itself and its implementation, um, let me first tell you a little bit about the motivation behind RingPop and why we chose to build it. Um, because the way that we design our backend systems on the real-time engineering team at Uber is heavily influenced by how we view our world and by how our, how our users operate um, within that world. So the dispatches team's responsibility uh, are one part mobile API, one part uh, matchmaker between rider and driver, so trying to find the best match for you when you open up the Uber app and put your pin on the map and request a car. And then final part, trip orchestrator. So once the trip begins, we're receiving all location updates from both rider and driver, so you can imagine the type of volume that we're receiving um, with however many uh, cities where we've got our service deployed in now, I think it's around 350. Um, and to, Uber, uh, to us, to the real-time engineering team, Uber is a platform of marketplaces, uh, of which transportation is just one. So if you're familiar with our Uber Eats service and our Uber Rush services, those are um, food delivery services and bike messenger delivery services, and we treat those as separate marketplaces. So, when it comes down to it, our backend systems are actually modeling the real-time interactions of physical entities in the real world. Uh, so you can imagine what type of systems we build to, to kind of replicate or emulate that world uh, digitally. It's a highly interactive platform, and we see our systems resembling more of a game engine with players in worlds and those worlds having constraints and different workflow. Um, and the transactions that occur on our system are, I would say, uh, a little bit unique. Um, they're extremely long running, comparatively speaking. They're on the minutes of minutes, uh, order, on the order of minutes to hours, rather than a, a few seconds uh, by, if you were to compare that to an e-commerce site uh, where you add something to your cart. Um, so this workload on our systems is quite unique because of the duration of those transactions. And there's certain inherent data locality to these systems, so highly tailored to point-to-point -point point communications between rider and driver. So a rider cancels a trip on a driver, and we have to send messages between uh, the both of them. So these characteristics force us to think about our architecture a little bit differently. Uh, so it might be hard to tell what, I'm trying to, what point I'm trying to make in these slides, but this is the original dispatching architecture. From, on the left side, there's a routing layer. On the right side, there's a dispatch layer. On the right side is where all the business logic happens for dispatch. On the left side, it's just trying to figure out where it should send those requests to the right-hand side. So first, the requests pass from the mobile apps through Nginx once they 
you know, find their way through the cloud. Uh, and then through Nginx, they hit some HA proxy servers, or sorry, instances. And then HA proxy load balances those requests to a set of specialized Node.js workers. And those Node.js workers are responsible for figuring out where in the world those requests are coming from. They, through a set of TWEM proxies, consult some Redis instances and figure out where in the dispatch layer those requests, the mobile requests, should go. And where they go is based on our sharding scheme. And originally, it was uh, a city sharded architecture. So there are pools of Node.js workers handling all of the business logic behind Uber. And they're separated by city. New York gets its own pool. London gets its own pool as well. Um, and these Node.js workers were fairly portable on the right side. They were actually capable of consulting a local Redis data store on startup to figure out which city they were operating on behalf of. And in a way, that information was exchanged with the routing layer on the left side. So it could know where to divert those requests when mobile makes them. And this system did us quite well for quite some time. Um, it actually got us through several New Year's Eves, uh, which is Uber's busiest time of year. But there were a lot of moving parts. You can tell a TWEM proxy redises on both ends of the spectrum. Uh, and lots of coupling in between the routing and dispatching layers. And though this dispatching layer was uh, horizontally scalable, uh, it was quite intricate. You had to change configuration within the redises, restart the workers, and then they would start operating on behalf of that city that you assigned them to. But the capacity uh, that was being provisioned for a city, let's say when New York was getting hot on a particular Friday, would have to be done on an individual city basis. So we had to throw more capacity at New York than London. And you can imagine this not scaling all that well. When we're operating in 400 cities, me or one of my colleagues having to type in a command line command to provision more workers was just not sustainable. Uh, and the system on the right side was fault tolerant, but again, manually so. So if a host went down during the middle of the night at 3 AM, we would have to wake up and change the configuration in these config stores, uh, restart the workers, and they would wind up on some other host and be able to serve that traffic. And finally, once that capacity was added, um, rebalancing was not automatic. Due to the nature of the implementation of our sticky sessions, uh, those sessions had to die out or new ones had to be created in order to take advantage of the new capacity that we added for that city. So, as you may expect, there came a point in time uh, where we needed to scale out this system beyond its capabilities. The engineering organization was growing. I think my team, when I first started, were five engineers. Now it's about 120, and the rest of the engineering organization grew to that degree as well. The product offering uh, was scaling, and our business opportunities uh, were growing as well. Obviously, Uber Eats and Uber Rush with delivery services. Um, we had to build systems that, that scaled with the business. So when designing a new system, uh, there's an evolution in thinking. You start with some really big goals, some really unrealistic goals, and then you go to some smaller uh, ideas. And some of the goals were, for this system, to scale by 100x. So a couple of orders of magnitude than we were capable of at that point in time, uh, rather than just building a new system that only gave us three to six months of runway. You typically don't want to do that. Uh, our systems needed to be always on which meant that we were more comfortable uh, sacrificing a little bit of consistency if it meant uh, more availability. Uh, so we were OK with getting the wrong answer uh, and correcting those mistakes after an Uber trip or further, farther downstream if it meant that we did not have to depend on a single master database to provide the right answer at all times. Um, so Finally, uh, we also knew that we couldn't deal with a monolithic architecture and code base that we had. Obviously, you know, maybe hundreds of thousands of lines later, the dispatch system uh, was growing old. It became brittle. Every change maybe caused some bugs in uh, other parts of the stack. Uh, so breaking things out into individual services gave us the flexibility to design systems that were more appropriate for their workload. So if there were systems that were more tailored or had to be more tailored towards drivers or riders or more geospatially focused, we could build a service that was narrowly scoped um, and can meet all of the requirements for that service. So, but between these services, once they were split out, there was a common need to be able to handle the data uh, in, a way that they, in a way that they were scalable and reliable. So this is the point at which uh, RingPop came about. It, it was born out of uh, 
the decomposition of a monolithic architecture and a monolithic code base. And once we had these microservices that were capable of solving the problem um, that they were meant to solve, then we also found a common need throughout these microservices so that it gave them some consistency uh, in programming model, some consistency in scalability, and some other characteristics, which, some of which are uh, ring pop being or having this notion of uh, being self-healing, uh, a notion of data locality and stickiness. Uh, ring pop is capable of auto rebalancing when capacity is added or lost, and it allows applications to shard according to their data set. So the way that it achieves this is by applying three techniques and bringing cooperation to those applications. The three techniques are its membership protocol, consistent hashing, and request routing. So I'll get into each one of those now. Um, Typically, in a traditional architecture, you have a three-tier architecture, and this is what your stack looks like. You have a front end, you have an application tier, and a storage layer. Two of them, the topmost, are stateless, and one is stateful, and requests flow from top to bottom. Um, of course, each of these layers is redundant for fault tolerance, but let's focus on the middle tier specifically, because it is stateless. Uh, and for the most part, all of its instances are on equal footing. Their responsibility is to take data out of the database, apply some business logic, massage the data a bit, and stick it back into the data store. Um, a completely stateless approach, though, may lead to a ultra-scalable application tier, but a storage tier that is uh, not as scalable. So in a ring pop world, Let's ask ourselves the question, what does a little more statefulness bring us? Uh, for one, there's a membership protocol that allows independent application instances in the application tier to discover one another, talk to one another, and share information with one another. And this coordination can lead to better and more efficient use of the storage layer beneath. Um, and in certain cases, if your consistency requirements allow for it, no storage layer at all. Everything is held in memory. And I'll talk a little bit about a geospatial index application that we built that is entirely stateful, uh, entirely stateful and has no down, uh, downstream dependencies whatsoever. So RingPop's implementation of the SWIM gossip protocol um, provides these discovery and communications facilities. Uh, and SWIM is an acronym for, let me get this right, Scalable Weekly Consistent Infection Style Membership Protocol. Uh, it's a mouthful, but it was designed by students at Cornell University in New York. Uh, the paper, the white paper, is freely available on the internet. It's actually quite an easy read, and it's quite easy to implement. Um, so this membership protocol, SWIM, acts as both a failure detection mechanism and a means of disseminating information about the cluster within your application tier. So let's see how SWIM works. Uh, here are three application instances zoomed in a bit, uh, A, B, and C you take note of those, those identifiers because they come, become important later. But assume for the time being that they've somehow managed to uh, discover one another, bootstrap themselves, and are operating at steady state on a converged membership list. So the, the membership list is besides each of the instances, and the membership list is globally agreed upon by all three instances. So the basic primitive of the SWIM gossip protocol is the ping, or a health check, uh, which each of the nodes do to each other periodically as they iterate over the membership list. So A pings B, then it pings C, then it pings B again, and rotates around uh, for every member in the membership list. This scales up to many thousands of nodes. So long as they're happily pinging one another and being responsive to one another's pings, uh, every member is considered to be alive. There are certain statuses that SWIM defines for a node in a cluster, uh, alive, suspect, and faulty. And I will talk a little bit about them now. Uh, here A pings B. So from left to right, and there are the stars that I talked about. Uh, and B, for this round, is unresponsive. So this starts the failure detection mechanism of SWIM, and by association, ring pop too. So SWIM says that A should randomly select n number of other members in the membership list and make an indirect ping against B. Uh, so here asks C to ping B. So actually, it would be worthwhile to tell you why it does that. Uh, and it does that because what happens if B is not the problem, but A actually is? If A makes a change to the membership list, 
but it is truly the problem, it's going to start to disseminate information about B to all the others and cause some weird disruption in the ring. So uh, A chooses some other members to say, hey, can you get a hold of B? And if you can't, then A knows that B may in fact be unreachable. Uh, there are really tricky network partition cases um, that you have to consider in addition to this as well, but I won't get into those uh, right now. So anyway, if C cannot get a hold of B, uh, then A declares B a suspect. It marks it in yellow there at the top left. And SWIM calls this whole indirect ping mechanism its suspicion subprotocol. And what it does is it sacrifices a bit of failure detection time for fewer false positives. So you may, might imagine like an intermittent network blip results in B being unresponsive for a short amount of time. You wouldn't want that, uh, you wouldn't want A to immediately mark B as a suspect. So uh, there's this bit of, of a grace period built into the SWIM gossip protocol. So now that A has marked B a suspect, uh, A sends a ping to the next member in its membership list, which is C. And it'll send over with that ping um, the fact that it previously recorded about B, which is B as a suspect. So here you see A pinging C, and with that comes instance B marked in yellow. Uh, so this is what SWIM calls its piggyback mechanism. It uses the pings that serve as a health check as a conduit for membership information to be passed as well. So that's actually a, quite a novel approach. You know how many requests in overall for your entire cluster are being performed at any one moment in time because pings and the indirect pings are being used as the, the mechanism to disseminate information. So this is infection in action. You ca, uh, the gossip protocol, um, the reason that they named it that or the reason that they named it infection style is because once a member becomes infected with an update, it spreads like a virus. Uh, so when C receives the ping from A, it applies the same update uh, to its membership list. So now at A and C, B is a suspect. They've now converged on the same membership view. And B is, I don't know, in some weird state in the process of crashing or what have you. SWIM also builds into its membership protocol some buffer time for B to uh, reassert itself as a healthy member of the cluster. But if that doesn't happen within a specific period of time, let's say five seconds, A or C are capable of marking B faulty. And what that does is actually removes it from the membership list. And this is how uh, RingPop is inherently fault tolerant. Because it implements SWIM, and because SWIM has this mechanism to kind of evict nodes that are unresponsive out of the cluster, uh, it is capable of adapting to the conditions of its environment. So now we have a two-node cluster, what, and what originally started as a, as a three-node cluster. Um, OK. So for the sake of time, I won't, I won't get into too much uh, detail about how a cluster starts from nothing and becomes something. Um, but SWIM actually doesn't say much about this join process in its paper. Uh, so what RingPop does is on startup, once a node or an instance of your application starts up, it'll fan out a join request to some number of members that have been provided to it in a seed list. Uh, so when A starts up, it'll fan out a request. If there's no one there, the join process is somewhat resilient to uh, failures and uh, there being no one there to answer the question. But when B starts up, it'll do the same thing as A. But in addition to sending out that join fan out, it'll also be capable of responding to somebody else's join request. And here, B responds to A. And with it, as you may have gleaned from the earlier slides, it uses this piggyback mechanism to send its information over to A. So A then applies B to its membership list, and, the next, and now that B is in A's membership list, A is able to ping it, and the next ping, A sends over the fact about itself, and now A and B have converged as a two-node cluster. The same process is actually repeated for, for many of the thousands or hundreds of nodes, however many you have. So that's, that's a pretty simple um, overview of how the join works. So how does consistent hashing now come into play on top, and how does RingPop leverage the membership protocol to integrate it with consistent hashing? Uh, for those unfamiliar with consistent hashing, it's an algorithm popularized in the late 90s and was used as a way to distribute cache requests. But the nice thing about consistent hashing is that there's a minimal amount of change or rebalancing of keys in the key space if the number of servers in your cluster uh, changes. So I'll explain that more in depth. So an application starts with a key space. Um, 
And you have to decide what your key space is. What data does your application operate on? And how might requests incoming to your application be divvied up? And a key space is just a name. The word key space is just a name for a range of all possible values um, of the IDs for the objects in your, in your system. So if your service is operating on users, then users might have IDs, and that's what your key space becomes. Um, so we project that key space onto the shape of a ring, and that ring represents the entire integer range. Consistent hashing tells us, first we must hash the identity of the nodes in your cluster along the ring, and they happen to fall randomly on the ring. So instance A is hashed, B is hashed, C is hashed, the members from the membership list and the demonstration that I gave you to you earlier. The hash function that we use is actually called farm hash. It's an it's a algorithm developed and library developed by Google, uh, which you can read about on the web. Um, so if we now treat this ring as a, as a pie, we change the, change the form of what it actually is, we can divide up the key space and assign ownership to, things that, to other things that fall along the same range. And what might those other things be? Well, it's the hash values of the IDs of the objects in your system. So anything, consistent hashing says that anything that hashes in between instance A and B is owned by B, so it moves in a clockwise direction. Anything between B and C belongs to C, and anything from C to A belongs to A. So let's say a first request is received by your application, and that application has an ID called user1. Before your application does anything, it first has to determine the owner uh, the node in the cluster that is supposed to process this data. So hashing user 1 fits in right in between A and B. And like I said before, B owns that. Now I get another request for user 5, and it hashes there. I get some other requests, and those two hash at a different spot and are owned by different nodes in the cluster. So you might be seeing, you might see where I'm going with this. Um, if there's a failure in the cluster, as detected by the membership protocol, that member is ejected from the membership list, as well as the ring, and you get some rebalancing. So anything that previously belonged to C, in this case, user 8, now actually belongs to the next nearest instance in the ring, which is A. So this is how ring pop is intrinsically fault tolerant. It's just as capable when adding capacity, too. So here I've reinstated C. He's back alive, and I've added capacity in order to distribute my load over the application instances in my application tier a little bit more evenly. Uh, I want to scale up, or scale out, if you will. Um, so anything like user 4 that previously hashed to A and now exists between C and D belongs to D. So we get a minimal amount of rebalancing or shift in the, in the key space. So now that we've... Oh, that's a little too close, huh? Uh, so now... Now that we've got a membership protocol, this diagram is a little weird, but uh, now that we've got a membership protocol and a consistent hash uh, ring built on top of that, the last piece of the puzzle is the routing. So this is what your application, your process space will look like. Your application is serving some HTTP traffic or thrift traffic. RingPop does not care about what format the, the, the request is in or what transport has brought that uh, request to you. Um, really what it cares about is the sharding key, which is that user ID. So as, once, once the request is parsed, you hand the sharding key value to RingPop and allow it, you kind of give control over to RingPop and allow it to make a routing decision. Um, that decision is, does this instance, does, do I uh, own this particular part of the key space? If it does, then it's uh, then it should process that request and apply all of the business logic. Otherwise, um, RingPop does the work for you by forwarding it to its rightful owner. So if user 1 belonged to B and this request happened to land on A, then RingPop will say, actually, this key belongs to B and send that request and forward it to the right instance. Um, so the beauty of this is that Clients calling into your service do not have to know about the underlying sharding scheme of your service. It can load balance fairly however it wants by hitting all of the instances in your cluster, and RingPop will intelligently route it to the correct owner. So let's talk a little bit about some code and how you program against RingPop. Um, a typical Node.js 
web application looks like this. Forgive me if you're, you're not a Node.js person, but um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Express is a, is a Node.js module. It acts as a web framework. It hides some of the plumbing of HTTP and gives you a simple way to ha han uh, register HTTP handlers. Here I've registered a put handler. Um, so users colon ID. Uh, when the request comes in, it tries to get the user out of the database based on its ID. If the user is not found, you send a 404 back. Otherwise, you perform some business logic, so on and so forth. Uh, finally, you call listen on the HTTP server, and that allows it to start uh, receiving incoming connections and dispatching requests to the handler. But since we're, since we're at a ring pop talk and have chosen to use ring pop, we'll, we'll first need to instantiate it. So follow the stars up there. Uh, that's ring pop being instantiated. And what have to be provided are two required parameters and uh, two optional parameters. Uh, the two required parameters are app, which is the name of the cluster that your application is in, and the host port, which is its identity in that cluster. The min protocol period is, um, is optional. By default, it's actually 200 milliseconds here. For some reason, I'm specifying uh, 1,000 milliseconds. And the join size, uh, by default, is 3. But here, I'm just illustrating that it could be changed to 2, which is that fan out factor that happens when ring pop starts up. Uh, all the rest of the code is the same. That might be tough to see, but what I've done here is I've invoked bootstrap, the bootstrap function on ring pop and moved the listen call into the bootstrap callback. And there's that seed list there passed as the first parameter to the, boot, the bootstrap function. If ring pop can successfully join two other nodes based on the join size that I provided in the constructor, then the callback will be called without an error and your application can start to listen to traffic. When requests arrive at your application, then you have to apply this routing logic uh, in order to give control over to RingPop to determine whether the owner of this user is the, instant, the acting instance or the owner is somebody else. So I've added maybe four or five lines of code up there um, to illustrate looking up the user's ID against a ring. The return value is the owner, which is just the, the host port of the um, or the identity of the node in a cluster. And if the owner does not equal uh, ring pop who am I, which actually just returns the value of host port provided in the constructor, then you have to forward the request. Otherwise, you perform the same business logic. Um, so this is, you can imagine kind of uh, applying those same four or five lines of code to every one of your handlers that needed to be sharded. Um, becoming t tedious. So that's why I suggested that RingPop is actually a routing middleware. It makes that routing decision before it ever reaches any of your application hand handlers. And this pattern of handling or forwarding and making that routing decision became so prevalent with RingPop applications um, that we baked it into its API and called it literally handle or forward. Um, so that's really all there is uh, to building the most basic RingPop application. Um, but let me talk to you a little bit about what applications we've built at Uber. Um, RingPop was built, as I said before, with the intention of serving very user-specific uh, requirements or geographic-specific requirements. Um, but we found actually really legitimate use cases in infrastructure-level service that, can be that have to be arbitrarily sharded. So it's really up to the application uh, to decide how it needs to be sharded and how it uses RingPop. So it has just as much use at the application tier um, that it does in the, in the infrastructure level. So I'll show you a couple of these examples now. Uh, this is the example of the geospatial index that I talked a little bit about for, before, uh, a completely stateful application. Um, so this service is responsible for storing all driver locations at the present moment in real time for the entire globe. And it's also responsible for answering the question, where are my, uh, or yeah, who are my n closest drivers given a point on the map? Um, Ring pop, uh, sorry, Geospatial's key space is based on S2 cell IDs. And S2 is a geometry library that breaks the uh, world up into individual cells. And each of those cells has an ID. So uh, what you might have uh, gleaned from that is that the ID is used as the lookup parameter to ring pop to find out who the owner of that particular portion of the world is. Um, so when Geospatial receives a request from dispatch, like, update dri uh, driver location, um, 
the same lookup is performed. It translates geo coordinates, the latitude and longitude values coming from the phone into an S2 cell ID, looks up that S2 cell ID uh, in the ring pop, finds that the owner is the, is the node that originally received the request. But what geospatial does that is unique from other applications is that it not only looks up the owner uh, in the ring, but it looks up its N nearest uh, neighbors in the ring as well. And those neighbors act as replicas. Uh, to give geospatial higher degrees of availability. So the update is performed not only against the owner uh, and stores it in memory, but it, that owner then fans out an update request to replica one and replica two. So if owner ever goes down and you need to answer the same question, well, you could get the same answer from replica one or replica two, providing more availability, like I said. The, the next example is a, of a service at Uber called um, UDestroy which is a service that can be programmed to kill other uh, services at Uber. This is, if you're familiar with Netflix's Chaos Monkey, um, this is similar. Okay, I only have 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, you destroy uh, engineers. What they do with you destroy is schedule failure scenarios, and periodically, you destroy checks for work to do against its database. But the, the key space that you destroy ha has is only made up of one hard-coded key. And that key acts as a way of electing a weakly consistent leader. Uh, I think this is actually quite a novel thing. So if you have a leader, if you have a key, and there's only one of them in your system, and it's called, the value of it is leader, you look up leader against ring pop, and ring pop will provide one owner back. So what happens if that leader ever goes down? Oh, sorry, I should back up and say that leader is responsible for pulling the database in you destroy and then delegating work to its backups. So what happens if that leader ever goes down? Um, well, the other nodes would detect it based on its membership protocol, and due to the consistent hashing, uh, that key will hash to one owner. So some other backup will be elected. Now this is not like a raft type system that is strongly consistent, but if uh, you have guarantees of like at least once uh, leader in the worst case and exactly once leader uh, in the steady state case, then this would be the solution for you. And you could imagine like pulling a message queue or something like that. If you want one thing to happen um, at a time, then this would be a good system for it. So there are other use cases of ring pop out in the wild. Uh, these are just a few server side push technology, just generic caching mechanism, data aggregation. If we want to count the number of online drivers in a given period, we sum those up internal to a service that uses ring pop and then flush the aggregates out to a reporting system, mailboxes for serial processing, so on and so forth. So I'll quickly go into some lessons learned because I want to get to some questions uh, if you have them. But some lessons that we learned in uh, development is that it's pretty hard to actually verify the correctness of the SWIM gossip protocol. Not because um, SWIM is hard, but actually because this is the first time that I ever did something like this. So we developed a command line utility called TickCluster that could launch an arbitrarily sized cluster on your local development machine. And TickCluster is just a Node.js script that you could pull down from the GitHub repo and just run it yourself. It allows you to specify uh, an arbitrary cluster size as well as kill and respawn any number of nodes in that cluster. And you could have fun by, uh, this is a screenshot of what TickCluster looks like, enabling debug logging and you can see them exchange all of the gossip information. Um, and that's actually how we proved RingPop uh, very early on before we were ever confident in its ability to do the right thing and converge on, on a membership list. Um, so this is good for smaller scales, but at larger scales we've deployed a staging environment called RingPopD. That staging environment is used to test RingPop in isolation and subject it to you destroy failure scenarios um, to see how it responds and how quickly it converges on a, a, an agreed, ans agreed upon answer. Um, our RingPop cluster is comprised of 1,600 nodes right now, but we have an internal initiative on our team to scale that up to 10,000 to see uh, where it falls down. Um, some production lessons learned. Uh, the oddest things could happen uh, before. If you didn't, don't put any provisions in your protocol to prevent two different applications from joining the same ring, um, it will happen. It did happen, and then we had to put the provisions in. Uh, Flappy nodes are a problem, so what happens if like, you deploy some bad code in your application which causes restart and start, or not, sorry, stop and start loops, continuously crash, restart. This is gonna affect the, the membership protocol in a way. Um, and you have to 
deal with flappy nodes and evict them from a cluster by, uh, to prevent them from causing any more harm. Um, ring pop information is actually hard to forget, even though all of the information is retained in memory and volatile. Uh, if one node has the latest information, it's going to try as damnedest to spread that information out. So actually making ring pop forget the information that it stores internally is quite hard. And it's only possible if you shut down your entire application at once and then restart it. That's both a blessing and a curse. Um, so anyway, in conclusion, um, let's go back to that original question, what is ring pop? Uh, let me run through some, some points that we've already hit. We've seen that ring pop brings cooperation to instances of your application tier. They become self-managing in a way. We've also seen that throwing additional capacity at ring pop uh, and losing capacity is inherently supported. Uh, we've seen that ring pop can arbitrarily shard your applications based on the workload that they receive. So, but you might ask yourself, why do you need this? Like, uh, why might you use ring pop? It turns out that the benefits of a naive stateless application tier may lead to unnecessary use and actually abuse of the dependencies that it has, like a database or like other services that you depend on. So ring pop is capable of making a local decision uh, based on globally agreed upon information. And this information is collected in a distributed, scalable, and faults tolerant manner, um, allowing your application to make more intelligent choices about its use of its resources. So uh, one example of this is like request coalescing. So if we use the serial queue processing as a way of determining similar types of requests uh, and those requests are queued up, if we want to hit a downstream uh, service with the same type of request, we, can only make, we only have to make one downstream request and serve the response to all other requests of the same type. So we're kind of coalescing and batching up um, uh, requests for the sake of the, de the dependencies that you have in your system. Anyway, in some cases, uh, the secondary benefit for applications like Geospatial Index is that RingPop's self-correcting nature uh, allows applications to be self-reliant uh, and completely stateful and eventually get to the point where they have no external uh, dependencies whatsoever. That's not really like the crux of the problem, but it, RingPop allows for that. Anyway, Wrapping up, all the things that I mentioned in this talk are not really new at all. If you're inspired or excited by any of this stuff, like, you, you'd be happy to know that other companies are doing similar things and there's lots of good material out there. So I'd recommend taking these down uh, and doing some Googling on their documentation. And that's my final slide. Uh, I will say that Uber is hiring. So if uh, you want to work with me, and it sounds like a fun project to work on, uh, Feel free to reach out to me. I work in Uber's Amsterdam office. So thanks, thanks for your attention.